Now, with the Black Lives Matter protests going on across the country, police use of force is a big part of the conversation here in the U.S. Today, in this video, I'm going to show you what police are trained to do. If it's your first time here, welcome to the channel. My name is Nate the Lawyer. I'm a former law enforcement officer, former prosecutor, and currently I'm a licensed attorney. Today, I'm going to show you the constitutional law behind police use of force and how law enforcement agencies have turned that constitutional law into policy. I'm also going to show you how police must obey those policies because if the officer does not obey the policy of their department, that could mean the difference between a life sentence and a justified use of force. Now for full disclosure, this topic takes hours to teach. I maybe have 20 minutes. So understand this is a simplified version. And as always, this is not legal advice. And there are some references of case law in the description if you want to delve deeper. Now, first, as always, we start with the law. And there are two cases that set out the standard for police use of force in the United States. Those are Tennessee v. Gardner and Graham v. Connor. Now, we went over the facts of these cases in our previous video, so I'm not going to do that again, but it's important to understand the rules that come out of this case. So let's start with Tennessee v. Gardner. In that case, the Supreme Court said that police cannot use deadly physical force against a fleeing felon unless they pose a serious threat of violence to the officers of the community. This was our serious threat threshold. Now, in a later case called Graham v. Connor, the court modified this rule. Now, in Tennessee v. Gardner, the rule was against a fleeing suspect, but here the court said whether against a fleeing suspect or otherwise, the analysis should still be the same. See, the Supreme Court demanded that a particular application of force must be judged through the perspective of a reasonable officer facing the same set of circumstances without the benefit of 2020 hindsight and based on the totality of the facts that are known to that officer at the time force was used. This was known as the objective reasonable standard. Now, the main point of this change was the question of what would a reasonable officer do? So the next logical question to ask is, what is a reasonable officer? How would the court know? How would an officer know what a reasonable officer would do? Well, the Graham court gave us some factors to help us determine what a reasonable officer would do. The Graham court believed that a reasonable officer would first take into account what the severity of the crime was. Are we going to an armed bank robbery in progress or is it a noise complaint? Based on the severity of the crime, the officer's response or use of force will be different. Was the suspect an immediate threat? That should seem familiar to you because that's Tennessee v. Gardner. And another factor the court listed was, was the suspect resisting arrest? Obviously, if a suspect is resisting arrest, police have to use force to subdue that suspect. Now, the court made it very clear. This was not an exhaustive list. Now, to comply with the constitutional requirements set forth by the Supreme Court, police academies started developing tools to help officers understand what a reasonable officer would do in various situations. This brings us to the use of force continuum. Now, this chart that you're seeing on the screen encompasses both the principles of both Tennessee v. Gardner and Graham v. Connor. This is to display how a reasonable officer should respond to various threats from suspects. So first, let's look at the various types of force that officers use in the field. Our first step is the officer's physical presence. Yes, an officer just being there is considered a use of force. Remember, the standard requires a threat or a threat of violence. Check out this show of force from the NYPD. Again, just with officer's presence, and not any type of physical interaction. So here in New York City, a show of force by the NYPD. CBS 2's Brian Connie Bear is live now in Times Square. More than 500 officers, many with military-style assault rifles, are now deployed at key transportation hubs like Grand Central, Penn Station, the airports, and other landmarks as a deterrent. The National Guard also mobilized 400 troops around the city Tuesday, all for one simple reason. We are the number one terrorist target in this country and potentially in the world. Police Commissioner Bill Bratton joined Mayor de Blasio on a tour of the Times Square subway station to reassure people. So, if you have one officer, two officers, or nine officers, the officer's presence is considered a use of force and would be the first step in our pyramid to move up the use of force continuum. The second level of force officers can employ are verbal commands, telling the suspect what to do. Stop. Put your hands up. Stop resisting. Here are some examples of officers giving verbal commands in different situations. How you doing, Ruffin? Are you fine? To, are you fine this morning? Can you just have a seat for me? I, 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 can you just have a seat for me? 
Step back. And as you can see from my pyramid, the second level of force or officer's verbal commands. Now understand this, 98% of all use of force incidents are in one of these two sections, either the officer's presence or the officer giving verbal commands. Our next level on the use of force continuum is what I like to call open hand contact. This is when the officer physically touches the suspect. We don't have any weapons, we don't have anything. We're just physically putting our hands on the suspect to either control them or even to arrest them. Check out this clip. Now again, I didn't say it had to be peaceful. You could have combative situations where officers are trying to control a suspect and that suspect is resisting. So this hand-to-hand -hand combat is our next level on the use of force continuum. So this fourth level on the use of force continuum is known as the less than lethal option. This is where the officer employs some of his defensive weaponry, let's say like his aspartan or his pepper spray or even the taser. Now, in most jurisdictions, things like tasers and batons are considered deadly weapons. Like in the state of Georgia, the outgoing Atlanta district attorney is describing that under Georgia law, tasers are deadly weapons. Uh, the second officer is Willie Sauls and charged with aggravated assault of uh, Ms. Pilgrim, and this is for pointing a taser at Mrs. Uh, Pilgrim. And uh, as many of you all know, under Georgia law, a taser is considered as a deadly weapon under Georgia law. A question a lot of people always ask is that what makes a taser and a baton deadly weapons in the hands of civilians, but not in the hands of officers? Well, that's an easy question to answer. It's the training and certification officers have to go through before they can even be issued these particular weapons. See, if used correctly, both a taser and an aspartan are less than lethal options, but if used incorrectly, they are dangerous weapons. I myself was a certified instructor in aspartan training, for instance, and part of our instruction was to show officers how to use the equipment properly so they wouldn't use it in a situation where it became a deadly weapon. But civilians don't have that training. Now, here's a CNN legal correspondent who says this. A taser is non-deadly force. Um, when officers use a taser, they will tell you over and over again that that is less than deadly force. So how is it, and I think this is what is going to be the problem for Officer Rawl, how is it that in the hands of Mr. Brooks, a taser, when an officer uses it, is not deadly force, but somehow becomes deadly force? Now to answer that question simple, the officers are certified and trained, just like a pharmacist or a doctor prescribing medication, right? That prescription pad in the hands of a regular person who's not authorized to have it is a crime, but in the hands of a doctor or even a pharmacist, it's lawful. The same thing with a taser or aspartan. Now it's important to note that when officers misuse these deadly weapons, they are also charged with crimes. For instance, let's turn back to the Atlanta DA charging officers who just pointed a taser at individuals with assault with a deadly weapon. Check it out. Uh, the second officer is Willie Sauls and charged with aggravated assault of uh, Ms. Pilgrim. And this is for pointing a taser at Mrs. Uh, Pilgrim. And uh, as many of you all know, under Georgia law, a taser is considered as a deadly weapon under Georgia law. So as we move up on our force continuum chart, the next level is obviously the taser and ass baton. Now we are at the top level of the chart. This is your lethal force option used extremely rarely, but it is the last resort of the officer. This is your firearm. This is what you need to use to save lives, to save either your life or someone else's life. This is as high as the officer can go on the use of force continuum. I don't even need to show you a clip because it's plain and simple. When the officer pulls his gun, it must be for a serious threat. So now you can see how our use of force continuum has built up from just simple presence to the use of a firearm. But now, how does an officer know what level of force to use on the chart? Can an officer just go to any event with their gun rays pointed at people? No. Where an officer is on this chart is determined by the suspect. The suspect can just be there in presence. The suspect can be talking to the officer. The suspect can even be actively fighting the officer in open hand combat. The suspect can have an ass baton or even some pepper spray. 
or the suspect could have a firearm. Now, depending on where the suspect is on this chart, that is going to determine where the officer is going to be on this chart. Generally, officers are generally trained to be one level ahead of the suspect. Here's another YouTuber, the donut operator, explaining it. When you go to the police academy, you learn about the use of force continuum, which says always be one level above the person you're fighting. Someone's going hands on with you, pull out your pepper spray or taser. If somebody pulls out a knife, pull out your gun. If someone pulls out pepper spray or a taser, also pull out your gun because they can incapacitate you with those. And then they have access to your gun and whatever's in your patrol car. Now, earlier we talked about the Graham v. Connor factors. What were those? Remember, it was the, what was the severity of the crime? Was the suspect an immediate threat? And was the suspect resisting arrest? Those were the things that reasonable officers would consider before they used force. And it wasn't an exhaustive list. Now, most jurisdictions have created a series of factors that a reasonable officer would consider before implying force. Now, combined with the factors from Graham, they are a powerful tool to assist an officer in judging how much force is appropriate to be used in any given situation. Let's go over some of those factors. First, we have the Graham factors. What is the nature of the crime? Are you going to a bank robbery in progress or are you going to a noise complaint? The second is the suspect's willingness and ability to resist arrest. Is the suspect obeying verbal commands? Is the suspect resisting arrest? The third is the imminent threat to the public. Is there an immediate threat to the public or to self? Is there a weapon nearby? And remember, this all depends on what a reasonable officer would think is going on in that situation. The next set of factors that officers must consider before they're implying force is the ratio of officers to suspects. If you have 10 officers and one suspect, then it's unreasonable for 10 officers to be holding guns, especially if the suspect is unarmed. But if there's 10 suspects to one officer, that changes the dynamic. Now an officer may be justified in using higher levels of force to protect themselves. Other things that the officer has to consider, the size of the officer versus the size of the suspect. If you have a seven foot suspect and a five foot officer versus a seven foot officer versus a five foot suspect. All of these things you have to consider before implying force. The strength and overall fitness level. For instance, some suspects are skilled boxers or MMA fighters. Hand to hand combat may put the officer at a disadvantage. What about the age of the officer and the suspect? What about the gender? And last but not least, whether the officer or even the suspect are injured, if they're exhausted, or if there's some disability. There are also environmental factors that the officer must consider. For instance, are you in a hostile environment? Do you have the ability to get back up to you in a short amount of time? Can you see what's your vision? What's the position, the distance and reaction time of the officer? What about disengagement? The suspect puts his hands up and says, I surrender. And also you have to account for stress. Now, the key point to all this is that these factors are always changing. And when the situation changes, a reasonable officer will adjust their use of force to the new situation. Now, I want you to take everything that we've learned about the use of force, the use of force continuum, and look at this example. Now, based on what you just heard, based on what I've said, it's going to be on you to judge whether this officer's use of force in this situation was reasonable. You got my ID? Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. ID. Come on, man. Come on, man. This is some bull, man. Why you never do that to me? Yo, you never do that to me. You never do that to me. Why are you doing that to me? No, get the out of here, man. No, no, no. Come on, get my dog, man. Come on, get my dog, man. 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 Yo, yo, this some bull, man. This some bull. This some bull. This. This some bull, man. This is some bull. This is some bull, man. This is some bull. This is some bull. This is some bull, man. This is some bull. This is some bull. This is some bull. I got no, I got everything on camera. I got everything on camera because I was walking with him. I got everything on camera. 
I got everything on camera. I got everything on camera. I got everything on camera. I got everything on I got everything on camera. I got everything on camera. Everything. I got everything on camera. I got everything on camera. I got everything on camera. I got everything. I got everything on camera. Look, look, he messy him. He messy him. He messy him. He messy him. So what did you think? The suspect was resisting arrest. What about the size and skill level of the officer versus the suspect? What about the numbers game? There were two officers to one suspect. Was backup call? Did gender play a role? What happened if there were two male officers versus a male and a female officer? How was the environment? Were they in a hostile environment? Now I'm gonna give you three seconds to consider if this officer's use of force was appropriate. You ready? One, two, three. Not enough time? Just imagine being those officers under that stress, having to make that decision in that amount of time. You can rewind the tape and take as long as you want. That officer has less than seconds to evaluate all of these factors and to come out with the right conclusion. Or they can be spending time in prison. Now, if you want to get a full list of the factors, look in the description. They are there. So at the end of the day, the NYPD cleared these officers because the department agreed that the officers used an appropriate amount of force to try to subdue a suspect who was resisting arrest. Now, here's an expert on CNN explaining exactly why these officers are justified. Here with me now, David Katz, CEO of Global Security Group, formerly with the DEA and a federally certified firearms and tactical instructor. So um, let's discuss what we just saw. I do know that Bill Bratton, NYPD uh, police commissioner, said that uh, he did not see anything inappropriate from the officer in the video. I mean, clearly, it, it appears the officer pulled the first punch. Do you agree with Bratton? Completely. Why? You do not have a right to resist arrest. Police officer tells you you are under arrest. You have one option, comply. What about the law as far as when you're approached by police um, and they're not explaining to you why they want you to be arrested, why, why they're approaching you in the first place? I want to place Are you required by law to explain to someone why you want to arrest them, why you're approaching them? In this case, apparently, it's because it was a, a That's an excellent question. Constitutionally, you are not. In New York, some states like New York require you or, or require you to, but only if the circumstances permit it. So, for example, if I can, you're under arrest for whatever charge. You explain the nature of the charge, your authority. By the way, it's the same for a civilian arrest. But in this case, if you're trying to and the person resists, you don't have to say, you know, throw your punch. And mm -hmm. by the way, I'm, you're, it's Robert, whatever it is. Uh, I think it's possession of a weapon in this case. So what did you learn today? Well, you learned that Tennessee v. Gardner and Graham v. Connor are the two cases that determine how officers' use of force are going to be judged here in the United States. And you've learned how jurisdictions have taken those constitutional principles and made them into tools like these use of force charts that officers can use to determine how much force to use in any situation. All right, the question of the day. Do you think the NYPD got it right? Do you think that officers' use of force was justified in that situation? You know what happened? Let me know if you agree with the PD or if you don't. It'll be an interesting conversation in the comment section. And if you made it to this part of the video, please consider subscribing to the channel. Give me a like, give me a share, you know, do all that great YouTube stuff. I also have Patreon, I have channel memberships. Help support the channel because videos like this get demonetized easily. So again, my name is Nate the Lawyer. Thanks for watching. Talk to you soon. Peace.